My name is John Carlson, and this is my Docu-Me life story. I was born March 30th, 1950, at Cedar Cyanide Hospital in Los Angeles, California. The day I was born, I was told that I had my umbilical cord wrapped around my neck about five times and was turning blue. And so I was happy to make it. <laughs> I guess that's how you look at that one. I've got uh, two brothers and a sister. They're all older than me, so I was the fourth. Uh, my oldest brother, Tom, or Ted, uh, just turned 80. And then my second brother, Bob, I think he's 78 right now. And then I have a sister, so if I'm 73, she's 75, I think. And so we had basically two sets, Bob and Tom together with a year and a half apart, then my sister and myself together with a year and a half apart. Um, probably be when I was about four or five years old is when I really started remembering my siblings. Um, I think I had my tonsils out when I was four or five years old, and so that's when I got extra attention. Um, and then we had a pool put in, and so that brought us kids a little bit closer, because Tom and Bob were both older than me, and I was sort of, you know, oh, the little brother, and so they didn't want to deal with me a lot. Bob would, but not, not so much Tom. He was in his own little world. Uh, Nancy and I, we, we were pretty close. We stuck together and we did a lot of things. Um, had a lot of neighborhood friends and were very, very active. In other words, well, it was way before computers. So there were no video games. Uh, 12 noon, you show up at the house for lunch and Sheriff John with your buddies, you know? So you all sit on the floor and you watch Sheriff John or something for half an hour and then back outside to play. What do I remember most about my sister? Well, she had an attitude. Uh, she was a little bit of a tomboy, but she was a little bit of a, um, well, if she didn't like the way things were going, you knew it. <laughs> uh, she would pout, and I think all of us kids ran away from home at least once, but we could only go as far as the corner because we weren't allowed to cross the street without an adult, so then we'd have to come home. Um, but Nancy and I, we went to the same school, uh, same high school. She went to a different junior high. And so in, in elementary school, junior high, we didn't spend a lot of time in school together because she was two grades ahead of me. Um, more so in high school, we did more things. And, but she had her own friends and I had mine. And as we got a little bit older, uh, she was forced to have to deal with me because if she wanted to do something with her friends, it was like, well, you have to take your brother with you. And it's like, oh, please, really? I said, yes, you got to take your brother. And so off we'd go. And I got along great with all her friends. But like any siblings, she didn't want to have to share me with her friends. One word to associate with each sibling. Um, <laughs> wow, that's a good question. Tom was very much regimented. I think regimented would be a good one for Tom. Bob, whew, he was adventuresome. But then he went and went to college and got a PhD and all that, so he was really, really smart. And then he went to work for me, which probably wasn't that smart. Um, and then he threw all that away 
and became a machinist. So I would have to say with Bob, you have to be religious. Nancy? <laughs> Nancy. Adventuresome. She loves to world, you know, travel the world. And that's what she's doing. Well, as long as her money holds out. <laughs> she may have to die sooner or adjust her travel plans. <laughs> okay, what do they think about me? <laughs> um, well, I've been the black sheep before, but I think I've crawled out of that one over time. Uh, let's see, what would Tom think of me? I'm... Well, that, that's, a, that's a good question. How would Tom describe me? Um, I think maybe adventuresome. Bob? How would he, is he Bob? He's oh. I'm not sure if I'm thinking he'd think I was adventuresome or I'd like to think he was thinking I'm adventuresome. Uh, <laughs> so I'll go with adventuresome still. Nancy? Little bro. I think that would pretty much just, I'm, I'm her little bro. Her little brother, and uh, she thinks I've done pretty well. So successful would be, I think, my sister's call. Yes, Bob and I, being adventuresome, always wondered and discussed what it would be like to swim in a pool full of water balloons. So we found out. Took quite a few water balloons. I don't remember how many we had, but off by the pool, we had a little dressing room and sink, toilet, shower, and everything. So we were real close to the pool. So we just started filling up boxes with water balloons, about yay, and dumping them in the pool until the entire surface of the pool was covered in water balloons. And then we went swimming. It was the weirdest sensation. It's just, needless to say, when Dad pulled in, tones changed. Now, we're looking at it as what fun this is, swimming around the pool with water balloons. Some are popping, some aren't. All he could see was the popped balloons getting into the filter system, Lottie, lottie, you know, basic parent thinking about, you know, the cost of damages and everything else that we weren't. But yeah, no, we did that. We were uh, diving off the diving board into this pool of balloons. Um, we only got to do it once, though. But it was something I, I was able to say, yeah, we did. It was, it was rather unique. Of course, then it, you run into the other times where if it was raining, and you wanted to go swimming, mom would say, well, no. It's like, what do you mean, no? It's summer, but it's raining. Yeah, you're going to get wet. It's like, mom, we're going swimming. We're going to get wet anyway. Oh, fine, do what you want. <laughs> so off we'd go to the pool in the rain. So. Um, yeah, we, we, we did get in a little, and this was one time that Bob actually got in a little bit of trouble. And Bob was dad's golden boy. Nancy and Bob, they were the middle two, and my God, they got good grades without trying. Tom and I, not so much. We tried, and we, we, we no, it didn't work, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> My father, one, he didn't want me. I was an accident. And he tried everything in the book to get my mom to abort me. 
And she says, hell no. <laughs> Thank you, Mom. Uh, but no, my dad was closer to Tom and Bob, the first two boys. Uh, Nancy, of course, was his pride and joy. And I was the one that came along after all that. And so I tended to get in trouble more than not, even if it was something I didn't do. Like Bob might mess up his shop, and he'd come home, and I'd be blamed for messing up his shop. shop. And I'd say, but I didn't do it, so then I'd be in trouble for lying to him. And unless Bob would step forward and say, oh, I did that, uh, yeah. So until I was 13, I found out my parents were going to get a divorce. Uh, I was always closest with my mom. My dad was pretty much, he'd get up, he was a stockbroker at his own exchange. He'd get up early in the morning, and he'd be gone before 6 in the morning. He'd be at work at 6. I wouldn't see him till that evening. And on weekends, he was usually in his shop cleaning the pool. So we'd go to church. He didn't. Uh, we'd do things, the kids and mom, and, and he'd stay home or he'd be doing something else. So I was much closer to my mom. Well, I'm not sure they're necessarily the favorite memories, uh, but I mean, I remember like when we got caught smoking or cigarettes because we'd steal them and go out into the area. We had a little area. Uh, in the backyard, it was all closed in, a fence, or the clothesline. My mom would hang her clothes, and we had an incinerator back there. And so my sister and I would steal a couple cigarettes, go out there and pretend we were smoking. So we'd, you know, get called on that. But it was interesting because she had a different philosophy. Instead of getting mad, she says, no, if you want to smoke a cigarette, then granted, I'm seven or eight years old. But she's telling me, if I want to smoke, just come on in and let her know, and she'd be glad to smoke with me. Well, what the hell fun is that? So that's why I never smoked, because there was no need to. It was something I could do instead of something I couldn't do. And so back in those days, if you couldn't do something, kind of wanted to do it, didn't you? And if you could do it, it's like, well, I'd rather do something I'm not supposed to do. And so that worked out pretty well, but we'd go, uh, I remember we'd go to the horse races once in a while, and at the races, at the racetracks when they weren't racing, usually down in Southern California, they had little nine-hole golf courses in the center of the track, a little pitch and putt. So my mom would take me and we'd go play around to golf. Um, or when we'd go on vacation, we'd spend more time with mom um, doing things than, than dad. Um, but then as I got older, we started spending more time together. And in the last few years of her life, I remember since we both worked in the same building, uh, there are many times after work, she and I go out to have dinner and drinks, which was really kind of interesting because we could talk about anything. And there was no topic that was off, off limits. And so I think the fact that she was there as a guide and protector uh, was the most important thing to me. I think she'd be very proud. Um, she wanted all of us to be, all of us kids to be successful. And I was the last one, I was 20, 25 when she died. And I was finally getting into my groove. I had uh, a job with the California Trucking Association uh, as a freight inspector, I'd learned that trade and I was working on that. And so I'd, I'd become successful. I, I had the starting of a career. Um, and as far as what I've done family-wise, I think she'd be very, very proud. Um, 
You know, I've turned out as good as anybody else in the family. And I'm 73, still working, you know. So, yeah, I'd say she's, she's pretty proud of me. When we, when we were young, uh, we would usually take about one week a year in the summer and go somewhere. Uh, this was Southern California, so a lot of times we'd go up to Big Bear Lake or Lake Arrowhead and we'd rent a cabin up there, mainly in the summertime because none of us were really ski enthusiasts. Uh, we also went to a place in Solvang, California called Alisal Guest Ranch and we'd have you know our own cabins and uh, it was all western uh, horse rides you'd ride out somewhere in the middle of nowhere and have a big breakfast and then you know ride on back um, and those were the the things we we primarily did with the pool we spent so much time at the house and we didn't really need to go away we had beautiful sunny weather uh, the beach was about four blocks away, and you're at, you know, down on the beach in the ocean uh, and a pool in the backyard. So, yeah, I was, as she, my lovely wife would say, I was the rich, spoiled kid. And as I told her earlier today, I was not a rich kid. My dad was. I wasn't. That's why I had to get jobs <laughs> and earn my way. I went to Hillsdale High School starting in 1964, graduate in 68. I think that's four years, right? Or 65. Oh, yeah, 65 I started. Uh, and that was in San Mateo, uh, the San Francisco Peninsula. Yes. Um, a couple that I, I do remember would be Mr. Beasley. He was my typing and office machines teacher. And I'll be honest, I am so thankful I took that course because now, I mean, working a uh, calculator or typing, it, I, I deal with a lot of people in my business, executives that are finger pickers they type like this and it's like how do you, how can you possibly type a letter like this and so I was very appreciative that he taught me those skills uh, my stepfather was a science teacher at the school and yeah I got him uh, that was interesting and then I had Miss Greco she was boys foods 11th grade and that was another fantastic class. It was right before lunch, so we didn't have to eat lunch because we just had lunch. But it taught me so much about, well, cooking, things like that that I feel very comfortable in the kitchen. And there was a time when I was in school where I was the one making dinners. My mom was working as a legal secretary and she wouldn't get home till six o'clock some night. So since I was there, I would make the dinners, um, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. We, I did learn that when you're boiling water or cooking something on the stove, you shouldn't get distracted and go outside to play Frisbee. Uh, I did that one time, walked into a house with smoke to my waist. I was going to make mashed potatoes, but instead we had little pieces of charcoal in the bottom of the pan, which was glowing red hot. So, once we got the house aired out, that pot was never the same. I think we tried to clean it, but I think we finally had to throw it away. It was that bad. So, but those were the primary teachers I remember. Beasley. Greco. I can remember other teachers, not necessarily all their names. We had one uh, English teacher that was, he was kind of an interesting dude. I uh, wouldn't put up with much, and he had a whole tray of erasers up by the chalkboard. 
And that's one class you didn't want to fall asleep in because he would literally throw an eraser from the front of the room and he was good. He could nail anybody in that room with an eraser. I mean, that was the way he was. But he was also cool because on a day like this where it's sunny outside, he'd say, hey, let's take the class out in the lawn. So we'd go out in the lawn and sit there and have class in the sunshine in the side yard. It was like, this is interesting. I didn't know we could do this sort of stuff. But high school was, I never was in any, any cliques or groups. Um, so I had, I had a few friends and I wasn't, you know, the, the football player that had, you know, all the friends and everything. I was more individual sports and, and stuff. So I stayed mainly to myself, especially because when I started high school, I just moved to the area. I was brand new to the area. I knew nobody. I had no friends and I was a little bit intimidated to walk into a brand new high school. I mean, this is high school now. This isn't junior high, this is high school now. And walking into all new, and everybody knew everybody, except me. So yeah, that we had one English class the first year in school that the, I, I'm not sure it was computers they were using to figure the classes out, but I remember walking into an English class, nothing but girls. Now, as a f new freshman, new community, new everything, don't know anybody, self-conscious as can be, and I walk into a room full of girls. It's like, is this a home ec class? Why aren't there any guys here? And I vividly remember I was sitting halfway back, the second row from the right of the class, as the teacher went through the class, getting everybody's names, a little bit about them, and then he says, tell you what, Let's just go through the classroom real quick and figure out where everybody's at. You know, kind of, I'll just throw a question to each one of you as we go along. So he started up there at the beginning of row one. Bam! What's an adjective? Rattle off an answer. What's a participle? Boop, boop, boop. I don't know. All the way. Then we start at the beginning of my row and I'm starting to sweat now because this isn't looking good. I was never good in English. And he gets to me, asks me a question. Needless to say, I'm the first one in the class that has no clue what the answer to the question is. So what does the teacher do? Come on, girls, let's help John out. I just wanted to sink down into my desk I was so embarrassed. I left that class, went straight to my counselor's office, said, get me out of that class. I'm not going back to that class. Now, in retrospect, that was the stupidest thing I could have done. I mean, all girls? But at the time, it was a little bit too much to handle. So I, I bailed. I, I was, well, you know when you play baseball, when we're talking sports, you're, you play football or baseball or basketball, any of the team sports. You know, you'd, okay, we got a couple captains. Okay, get captains. Okay, pick your teams. I'm here. Hello. I was the last one to be picked. It's like, oh God, baseball. Oh, put me in right field. I don't know how to catch a ball. I, I was never good at judging when somebody, when the crack of that ball hit the bat and that ball started coming my way, it's like, oh fuck. I gotta be under that thing when it comes down and I don't know if I should run forward or if I should run backwards. So I just said, put me out, I'll, I'll do right field. Because very seldom balls came to right field. And 
So baseball, no. Football, uh, no way in hell. I wasn't going to go get beat up. I wasn't big enough. Uh, basketball, again, wasn't big enough. Didn't understand the game either. I mean, there's a lot to basketball I wasn't sure about. You know, if you're an offensive player, you can do certain things. If you're a defense player, you can do certain things, and there's certain things you can't do. You know, you can touch a guy now, and nope, you can't touch him now. It got very confusing, so I figured, let's stick with individuals. So I, I basically picked track, track and field. Uh, I ran sprints, ran the hurdles, and the high jump, and distance, and then cross country. Um, I got into swimming once, and I had to back up a little bit until my parents divorced and we moved to the Bay Area. I didn't have this hair. Every Saturday, Tom, Bob, and me would go out to my dad's shop and sit on the stool and he'd put the towel around us buzz cut every week. So I had no hair. And when I finally moved to the Bay Area, this was, I mean, 64. Who came out around that time, singing-wise, from England? The Beatles. Well, they had long hair. I was growing my hair. So I grew my hair out. And then I decided to try it for the swim team. Well, because I'd always have a swim pool, I was pretty good swimming. And so it was trials, and so jumped in, swam the length and back, and I remember the coach, Joe Pachisi or something, was standing at the end of my lane on the deck, jumping up and down, going, get this guy's name! Because I came in way ahead of everybody else. Well, okay, so he was happy, he wanted me on the team. He says, now go get a haircut. Oh, whoa, 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 haircut? I just grew this. So I did, I went down and got a haircut, cut up a little bit, showed back up. He said, I thought I told you to get a haircut. I said, I did, he goes, get another one. Okay, we're getting iffy now. So I went down and I got another haircut. Showed back up and he goes, no, I want you to have your hair cut off. I said, later. I don't need your swim team that bad. I'm keeping my hair. And that was the end of the swim team. So cross country and track was all I ever really did. Well, when I moved to the Bay Area, I realized uh, in high school you need money. So it was time to get jobs. And... My first job in the Bay Area was working at a friend's parent's nursery. And back in those days, manure, steer manure was used, but it didn't come nicely prepackaged the way it does now. There was a bin, and a dump truck would come, fill the bin. So when people would buy manure, somebody would have to shovel it into their trailer or their trunk or w so I was the shut sh shit shoveler that's it I was the shit shoveler and that's what I did I just shoveled shit and that wasn't what I wanted to do so a buddy of mine decided once I got a car that we do yard work so we throw a lawnmower and a couple things in the back of the car and we just drive around till we saw a neighborhood that had some lawns needed to do, we just knock on doors, say, do your, and then we put the uh, clippings in the back of the car, and we'd dump them at night, so we'd have a fresh, clean car to put dumpings in again, and, and then I worked uh, as a Chinese food delivery person, and then between deliveries, I was also the bus boy and the dishwasher and I had to wash the vegetables in a big bathtub out back. 
I mean, they were interesting jobs, but they liked me for the delivery guy because back then we didn't have all these nice little cell phones that told you where to go. And they realized that a lot of people don't know how to read a map. Uh, in that time, we were located in an area called Hillsboro, which was a very ritzy area and had no square or straight streets. It was all windy roads and you might have to take six or seven turns on different streets just to get to one house and then remember you'd have to remember how to get back to the restaurant um, plus tips were good too let's see what oh uh, I worked for my stepfather because he ran the student store and so I would come in after school and he, there was a little office between classrooms and I'd sit in there and I'd run the tallies for the school store every day so that was another pen key calculator running tallies and doing financial stuff for them to make sure the store was good um, I did work at Kinney Shoes in the Bay Area for a while um, that was just a shoe store you know until somebody really tall walked in and realized it was Wilt Chamberlain. Um, I forget what size, I think he was like a 13 or 14, but nicest guy in the world. You know, so here I am, a teenager, selling shoes to Wilt Chamberlain. It was kind of like, but I'd gotten used to actors and things living where we'd lived. Um, before we'd moved to the Bay Area, uh, Nat King Cole lived about four blocks in one direction, the owner of the Los Angeles Times four blocks the other direction. And so as a kid, I remember in the Palisades in the hobby shop, I was not that big, turned around and ran right into the belt buckle of Marshall Dillon. He lived in the Palisades and he was there with his kids at the hobby shop. And I was being a little kid, you know, running around the hobby shop, turned around and literally ran right into him, looked up. And I swear to God, I'm looking at Marshall Dillon. And he looked at me and I go, careful there, boy. <laughs> it's like, whoa. But uh, having people that were in Hollywood around was, I mean, driving along and there was Alfred Hitchcock in the car next to us one day in a taxi cab with his little pouty lips. Um, I forget the actor, but the guy that played Paladin, uh, you'd see him. And, and so it was, it was kind of, it was a whole different world back then. I mean, under 10 years old, if you were seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, you'd go out and do things you wanted and you didn't have to worry about stuff. Now, oh, totally different world. So, I mean, I, I lived a really good childhood. And even as I grew up and went through all the schools and got out of high school, um, I was still having a good time enjoying things. Um, of course, that's, you know, when you get out of high school, 68, Vietnam War, got those things going on. So it was the best and the worst of times. That's a good way to say it. Because there were, I mean, there were fantastic things about the time. Um, I remember in Los Angeles that we lived in Hancock Park, yet this is before I'm 14, so 10, 11, 12 years old. I'm riding my bike through Los Angeles to Santa Monica to spend the night at a buddy's house. I mean, that would be unheard of today. But we, we just knew it was okay. And so we disappear in the morning. And as long as we were home at dinner time, it was all good. 
you know, I'd, my buddies and I, we'd go up to Hollywood Boulevard on our bikes, you know, ride along and walk around the sidewalks, Griffith Park. I mean, it was all wide open to us because we had bikes and we could ride. And we did. As I was finishing my senior year in high school, I wasn't really anxious to jump in to go to high, uh, college. Um, I wasn't sure where I wanted to go or what I wanted to do. I, I, I didn't have a, a direction. And so right out of high school, I got a job with uh, Ma Bell, the phone company, as a motorized messenger and started thinking about the military because the draft was now here and it was time to sign up for the draft and you don't know where your number was going to be. And so Vietnam was looming. It wasn't a very popular thing. Uh, the, the guys coming home from Vietnam were treated terribly. And I really didn't want to be laying in a foxhole in Vietnam, so I decided rather than being chosen, I would choose my destiny. And so I applied to the Coast Guard, and then I also signed up for the Naval Reserves. And so that way I alleviated uh, the Army calling me up and saying, see you in a week. And that sort of got me set. In other words, now I was committed. And so it was um, late, well, it was Christmas, December 22nd of 1968 that I went to boot camp. And then I was in boot camp for the full term, came back, was home for about six months and went down to Pensacola, Florida for Class A school as an electronics uh, communications technician, electronics branch. And so that um, basically got me through the next few years uh, until I got my discharge um, from the military. And then I was sort of wondering where I'm going to go again. And that is when I actually got into scuba diving after uh, the military. My stepfather and I decided that that Scuba diving would be something that I've always wanted to do, and he wanted to do it. So he suggested, since he knew somebody that was an instructor, that we take classes. Hey, it sounds good to me. So we did. And we did our uh, open water dives down in Monterey, California. Um, beautiful place to, to dive. And then from there, my stepfather suggested being a diving instructor. And I'm thinking, well, that's an interesting concept. And so with, with his help and my mom's help, I got enrolled in uh, NASDS, uh, Diving Instructional College in San Diego, uh, back in early 73. And was, went through, a, I believe it was a 12-week course down there in San Diego, became a certified instructor then moved to Venice, California, where I got a job with the uh, world of scuba diving in Venice, California as an instructor, and then I worked in the shop also. And that basically lasted about nine months. And then the shop owner and I had a come to Jesus discussion where he says, well, you're not selling enough product. And I said, well, okay. And I understand it's a store and selling product is, you know, what you do. But I was working with my students and instead of putting them into a world of credit card debt, I showed them how they could slowly buy equipment and rent equipment and do it 
in a better fashion than putting themselves into debt. Well, that may be great for the student, but my boss didn't like the, ther you know, the, the, the theory. His theory was sell them the most expensive stuff and the most of it you can. And that just wasn't right. That, that's not who I was, taking advantage of people, you know, as an instructor, they're looking up to you and saying, you know, what should I buy? What should I have? Well, I could tell them, yeah, Scuba Pro, Mark, Mark 7, that's what you need. No, you don't. But that's what my boss told me they needed. And so we finally just parted ways and I said, no, I can't do this. So I uh, was down in Venice, California in an apartment and no job at 23 years old. Now, if I was independently wealthy, that would have been a great place to be. But since I wasn't, it wasn't such a great place. So I ended up driving school buses for elementary school in Los Angeles. <laughs> and that, that lasted till the end of the season. And I decided, well, screw this. And I moved back home to the Bay Area and started teaching classes out of a dive shop in Belmont, California and working there part time. And then uh, I got another part time job working, uh, driving school buses. And so, again, going on 25 years old, still don't know what I'm going to do. And that's when the California Trucking Association, Harley Calloway, worked up on the third floor, and he was in charge of some inspectors. That's all I knew. And at the time, it was summer break from driving school buses, so I was working in the mail room and in the print shop, uh, doing whatever I could to help. And one day, Harley came down to the mail room. We had a little half door, and he leaned on the half door there and says, Hey, how you doing? Uh, we're pretty good. How would you like to be a freight inspector? Well, I thought for a second, that sounds it. What's that? And he told me a little bit, you go around, you inspect damage freight, write up reports, take pictures. Now I'm thinking, now this sounds like a job I can get into. Driving around, your own boss, taking pictures, having fun. Yeah. So that's what I ended up doing. I rode with a law student that worked for Harley in the San Francisco downtown area. I rode with him for about two weeks, sort of learned the job, and then I got San Mateo County and started doing all my inspections there. So I had South San Francisco down to San Jose. And then I picked up San Jose and the rest of the Southern Bay Area. How did I meet mom? Well, I was the president of Friends of Bagby Hot Springs back in the day, and we were working with the Forest Service, and one of the things that we needed to do is we needed some new cedar tubs, which means we needed some trees. We had to literally cut down some trees, so I had to go to my counterpart with the Forest Service and negotiate that. Uh, I nearly died when he said we'd have to pay for the trees. And I'm thinking, oh, this isn't good. Then he told me that each one would cost us $12. Now, that was a price I could, I could live with since the trees were going to be about five foot diameter. And so we got that all squared away. And then Oregon Public Broadcasting got a crew, and we got a logger, and we got a whole work party together, and we were going up to Bagby to fall these two trees and cut them into tub sections so we could start carving out new cedar hot tubs. And my cohort with the Forest Service, 
Steve Sorseth. Um, he was coming up, and since Sharon, my lovely wife, had just moved here from Baker City, Oregon, and had taken over as the office manager, he invited her and her son Michael to join them for the day, him and his girlfriend, to come up and see a little bit of the forest that she was working in now. And so that's when I first saw her, when she got out of the car at the Bagby Hot Springs parking lot and stepped to the back of the car, and then Michael got out. And all I could remember was, who is that woman? I still remember exactly what she was wearing. And so when they came over to the trailhead and we were introduced, nice to meet you. She finally had to pull her hand away. <laughs> and so I decided, okay, well, got a little boy here. He's going to have to be entertained. And since I wasn't allowed to do any work, um, because I tried to cut my finger off on one of the first work parties, uh, I was the president. So it was my job to, you know, just take care of things, you know, be administrative type. So with Michael, I took him down and showed him all around the area. And then we all had lunch and she shared her, her chicken with me. And I offered them to stay for our spaghetti dinner. But since she didn't know who I was and wasn't too sure about this, long hair, bearded, cowboy boot guy, you know, all the things she was going, no way, uh-uh, I was that guy. And so after they left, I'm thinking, I got to figure out how to meet her. You know, I got to have a reason to call her because, you know, like every guy, you don't want to get shot down. So I talked to Steve and he says, well, what you need is if you need a new flag for the site, you'd have to call her to get it. I thought, oh, thank you, Steve. So I did. I remember it was a nice sunny day. I was going water skiing with some buddies from uh, Bagby and got out a little early. And there was a payphone right there. She came into the park, Rooster Rock. So I parked, went over, put my little dime in the phone, called the Forest Service and asked to talk to her and reminded her who I was and that we needed a flag for the hot springs and I was told she's the one. Well, we got that arranged, that worked out well. Then I had to ask her out and I'm going, how am I gonna do this? So I, I decided, you know, I've got a little boy, a little long, younger than Mike, we gotta all get together. Well, I, I don't date people I work with, but I don't work at the Forest Service. So we don't work together. Well, yeah, but I'm not sure I'm ready to go out on a date. It's not a date. It's just to get together. I'm making this real simple. Just a simple, you know, we just get together. She did. She said yes. I'm going. And so basically the rest is almost history. We, we did get together, and the first thing we did is went roller skating because I knew she'd have to hold on to me. <laughs> I'm not a stupid person. So we did. We went roller skating, and the boys got along great, and one thing led to another, and within nine months, we were married. The day I knew she was the one was literally the day I met her. You know, they say love at first sight and all that. Yeah, yeah it can happen. I mean, it, it's a visual that has been in my mind ever since that day. You know, it's like, wow. You know, and then she was smart, too, which was like, well, that was a plus. You know, pretty, smart, and she had a kid about my kid's age. I said, this is looking good. You know, so one thing just led to another, and like I say, we ended up getting married within nine months, and then she adopted you, 
and I tried to adopt Michael, but couldn't do that until he turned 18, because his father wouldn't sign off on it. But the day he turned 18 is the day we got adopted. Now she might, she might have a different answer, but I think I did. I think I did. And I was trying not to be too pushy, because that is, you know, guys get too pushy, and they, the girls, oh, you're too pushy, and leaves. And I thought, oh, God, I hope that doesn't happen. So, yeah, I, w I must have been just right. I proposed at Bagby Hot Springs. Since I was the president, I could have a little influence. And one of the things we did at Bagby is we had a volunteer group. Well, everybody was a volunteer. But we actually had volunteers who would stay on site. Uh, we had the original cabin that was the ranger cabin. And we had gotten a donation for a pot belly stove so we could keep it plenty warm. And there was the original furniture was just wood furniture with rope seats and a rope bed. I mean, it was the stuff that was made back when they founded the hot springs and they, they built it all. I mean, it was just like that. And so I decided I wanted to take her up there for a couple nights and, you know, it was, I believe it was during winter. Yeah, it was. It was because it was snowy. And I remember sitting in the two wood chairs and proposing to her at Bagby. Yeah, I figured that's where I met her. That's where I should propose. Uh, the wedding day was, was fun. Um, I didn't have to do a lot because pretty well planned ahead of me. But we decided to get married at the Baker Cabin Church in Carver because we didn't want a huge, we didn't need a huge wedding. We just wanted something nice and simple and her, her parents came and this is when I first met them. That's right. I remember I was working on a sewer system in the backyard when they showed up and I met them for the first time. And the wedding cake was in the shower of the motor home. But I remember going to the church and Sharon was in the motor home because so, we couldn't see each other. She was in the motor home and I think she was going to be late. But we all got to the church on time and it was, it was beautiful. A nice little quiet ceremony in a beautiful little historical church. The aspects I appreciate the most is that she's just a very loving, caring, compassionate woman. She will do anything for anybody that she possibly can. Um, she'll be the first to say yes if there's anything she can do to help somebody. Um, she's patient. She's put up with me. That's a plus. Uh, and she just maintains her beauty in, inside and out. You know, even though she's been through a rough year and a half and uh, we almost lost her, we didn't lose her. Her personality is still right with us. It was a way that we could interchange doing and having fun with work. Um, Work was busy at times, quiet at times, but we got involved with uh, Rockaway Beach Timeshare, and that led to the Shoots River Ranch and on to other timeshares. Um, and we used to really take advantage of those. We'd be on, we, every Friday morning, we'd be calling the beach saying, got any vacancies, you know, on a wait call list. And if they did, we'd be picking the kids up at school and heading straight to the beach for the weekend. Uh, we did that a lot. And then when the kids were older, then we could get away without them. So we'd start taking 
little trips here and there when we could get away. Getting away was, was tough for a week at a time. Uh, being a sole proprietor and having a, a time urgency to the work that I did, it was difficult to get a complete week at a time. So if we could get two weeks a year and then long weekends, because I could take a Friday or a Saturday and we could shoot off to Vegas or up to Victoria, Seattle, you know, do whatever we wanted. And that was a real nice way to do it because I love to drive. Um, I don't really like the hustle and bustle of having to go through the airport crap and security and be crunched in a seat and you know all that and now you're in a flying tube with everybody's germs you know not really my cup of tea I and then when you get there you got to rent a car or you don't have any transportations and then you're limited on what you can take because when we go on vacation for a week or even a long weekend we'd like to be comfortable we'd have our own bar we'd have our own music we'd have you know clothes for any occasion i'd have my little suitcase and mom would have hers um, we did go down to mexico and the first time we read the tour books and we had seven bags and learned we only needed two bags. Uh, <laughs> so through trial and error, we, we did learn that, okay, we, we've scaled down if we're going to fly. But uh, as far as driving, I would pick driving over flying any day of the week. Now, I'd love to take a train trip because I understand those are, I, I remember as a kid living in Southern California, taking a train to San Diego once, and that was a blast. And so that's something in, on our book to go do again. And, uh, but you no, know, getting away, um, it was one of those, we worked hard, but we played hard. And now our kids are in, that stage where they work hard and they play hard. Blending of families. Um, that can go many different ways. And I, I really think that we lucked out and it just blended perfectly. I mean, realistically, people that, you know, friends that know us that aren't, don't really, don't know us from way back, uh, they might think that our kids are biologically reversed. In other words, that Michael would be mine and Josh is Sharon's. And it's like, no, no. But because, and the age of the kids made it perfect. It was sort of like my two brothers or my sister and myself. We were a year, year and a half apart, so we were close enough in age that we did a lot of things together. And that's where I see, you know, Josh and Mike um, doing things together, you know. And so when we do things, uh, it was always a, sort of a family thing. We did have issues. Um, Michael got spanked once, I think, because he was playing with fire. And now he has been with the fire district for 20 plus years. Uh, but Josh was the one that would try us the most. He had moments. Now Josh has enlarged the family on his side with Marnie and two kids. Mike is enlarged on his side with John. And on our wedding anniversary this year, they're going to start to grow a little baby. And so that will come sometime between Josh and my birthday of next year. So that's something we're all looking forward to. The things that I'm most proud of when I look at my boys is their, their own success and their own families. Uh, in other words, we took them from little boys and we helped and nurtured them up to a point that they became young men. 
and then men and got out on their own and have done well. So I, I feel that that initial teaching, um, life lessons, the way you know we treat each other, the golden rule, uh, all those things I think have come to rest in each of you. Oh, what is it? What does it mean to be a parent? Well, it's probably one of the biggest responsibilities you got. Um, it's one of the most challenging things you'll ever do. Because almost anything you do in life, you're trained or you learn. In other words, if you're going to be an engineer, you got to learn all about engineer. If you're going to do race driving, you better know how to drive a race car. But being a parent doesn't come with instructions. Uh, and that's part of the problem in this day and age. Um, I think being a parent is uh, an opportunity for somebody to share themselves and grow and nurture somebody else. And it's a very rewarding feeling knowing that you're not on this earth just for this time and then it's all done because if you're a parent you're hopefully your kids will carry on and their kids will carry on and they'll have that same opportunity that that we had as, as parents um, as you get older your role of parenting changes you know when the, when your children are young you've got to really be on top of things but when they get older and they're out on their own you've got to let them live their life you may not agree with it all the time uh, you may agree with it you may be envious I mean there's so many things that you get to see a fulfillment uh, we talk about when mom and I were younger doing a lot of long weekends, uh, you know, going, going, going. We're not doing that as much now. And there's, of course, reasons, physical reasons why we're not. But we're, we're seeing our kids and our grandchildren starting to do that now. And, and it's, it's just a neat feeling. Uh, you, just, you go, wow, that's part of me. I, I helped create this this person, you know, with not only what's what's in us, but how we are ourselves. Because your children pretty much become a mirror of you. Because having kids, it it not only allows you, but it encourages you to be a kid. Uh, going out to the river. You know, damming up a river with rocks or diving, you know, down into a river. You know, all these different things, you know, we did as kids. Uh, playing, you know, war games out in the backyard, you know, crawling through high grass, you know. Uh, kids are, you know, kids are 10 years old and not much older than that. <laughs> but getting out there and playing with my kids, uh, that's what it's about, being, being a family. Uh, generous, loving, courtesy, courtesy um, compassionate, well, well versed, um, in other words, our family isn't one that everybody, in other words, everybody's got a slot, whether it's mom, dad, boss, your kid, whatever it is, everybody's got their, their place. Um, and I, I look back on that and I sort of think, well, 
every everybody just seems to blend together so well in our family um, even if there's uh, an upset with the apple cart it seems like everybody just sort of pulls together and fixes the apple cart in other words it's not every person out there for themselves you know whether it be my wife my kids myself we all support each other every way we possibly can and I think that is what I look back at and see is the most precious thing is the love that uh, we, we give and we get because you, you get what you receive you know and like the golden rule treat others as you want to be treated if you can remember simple things like that you should do well in life well I think when you've got decisions that you have to make which is daily I mean all day long we're making decisions you know people say well I never get my choice yet yeah you choice you're choosing things all the time you're choosing when to eat you're choosing what to eat you're choosing where to go how fast to go uh, you're choosing whether you're gonna say hi to the neighbor you're all day long you're making choices and I think that you need to understand that when you're making choices you when it's an important choice you need to think about it and it's important because it's important to make the difficult right decision versus the easy wrong decision and I, I think about our grandchildren and I hope that they choose the path of working you know I hate to say working hard working smartly uh, that was sort of a term that we had with scuba diving I would teach people to dive with their head not their back and so many dive instructors before they'd even let a student be in the class they'd say okay get in the pool start swimming laps and they do that to thin out the class so they would get the best swimmers in their class well no that's that's not how you do it you know you, you treat everybody fairly yeah like in, in diving when when you're doing a dive I would tell students it's not how far how much ground you can cover it's how much you can find in the short amount of ground you cover in other words slow down Take a breath, think about it, and then move slowly. But above all, relax. Everybody seems so tense nowadays. It's like, I'm worried about this, worried about why? Worrying doesn't help anything. And so, yeah, you can be concerned about something, but no need to worry about it. Lots to think about nothing to worry about just be true to yourself um, and don't accept something unless you're willing to go all the way in other words if somebody offers you a position a job or whatever it is if you're not fully committed don't do it because you're just going to let yourself down and let your friends down. So when, if you're going to do something, you got to commit 100%. Well, it wasn't quite that. When the ditch digger story did come up a number of times in my career, life, childhood, whatever. Uh, it started, of course, with my grades not being you know and it was always you're gonna have to get better grades or you're gonna end up being a ditch digger well after you live with that for so long and you get a little older and a little stupider and you go well that's true I might be a ditch digger but do you know how much they make that didn't go over well no 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 so <laughs> 
Yeah, I've had the ditch digger conversation. But unfortunately, in this day and age, it doesn't work anymore because ditch diggers are making $100,000 a year. So it's like, well, that argument went out the window. So like I say, whatever you're going to do, commit to it 100%, and you'll be the best damn ditch digger there is. When I got started in my career uh, as a freight inspector, um, I didn't even know what it was but I learned quickly, and I found it was something I really enjoyed. Um, I was out. I was sort of my own boss. I felt real important because I had a pager and a pocket full of dimes and quarters. And that's how we communicated back then, because there were pay phones and there weren't cell phones. And so after uh, I got started with the California Truck Association, then Harley wanted me to start training new inspectors and so I was training new inspectors for the Bay Area, Sacramento and Fresno, those areas. In fact, I trained my brother Bob and he took over in the East Bay of the San Francisco, Oakland, San Rafael, those areas. And then um, up in the Sacramento area, I hired and trained my brother-in-law my sister's husband, and so he was an inspector in the Sacramento area for a while. And then after three years, uh, Josh had come along and living in the Bay Area and realizing a couple things. One, associations don't pay much. Secondly, the only way I was going to advance is if my boss or his boss died or quit. And I didn't say that happened anytime soon. So I decided that I was going to take a trip from San Francisco up I-5, Portland, Seattle, Spokane, Boise, Salt Lake City, and loop back around in the Bay Area. And after that, decide where I wanted to be. And friends from the Bay Area had moved up to the Portland area, so I contacted Dan, and he says, well, hey, my dad and I have a siding business, and we need a general contractor. So that's how I ended up in Portland. I moved up here. Josh was less than a year old, uh, sick, and I moved up here and took a job as general contractor for an uh, aluminum siding company. That lasted six months until I found out they were skimming and cheating the government and doing all sorts of terrible things. So I said, well, I can't work for you anymore because you're not paying me. And then I called the IRS and explained the situation to them and then I went about my life. Um, and that was calling my old boss, Harley, and saying, Harley, I got a Polaroid camera and I got some film. Could you send me a case of inspections? I'm going to try and do that here. And he did. He sent them the next day. And so I grabbed a clipboard and my Polaroid camera and started going to the truck lines, Garrett Freight Lines, Transcon, PIE, you name them. I started knocking on doors and one by one, they started coming around. And then I started to increase my learning. And then I became a certified claims professional. And besides doing the uh, damage freight inspections, I was doing packaging evaluations and started teaching cl cargo claims. I taught at Washington State University and taught at uh, Clark Community College, to name a couple. And then I got contacted by um, Great West Casualty. Uh, they insure probably 50% of the trucks in the country. And they've got plenty of adjusters that when there's a truck accident, 
they wait until the truck gets back to the tow yard and a day or two later they show up and they look at the equipment, they take pictures and they write it up just like they would your automobile at the body shop. I was the one they needed for the cargo. And so my entire job with Great West is cargo because I'm not an insurance adjuster. And so we didn't want to get in trouble calling myself an insurance adjuster. I am a cargo claim investigator. And when things go bump in the night or the trailer falls over on the freeway and breaks open and the cargo spills out on the freeway, that's my problem. And so that's when I get the call. I'm on, people ask me, what hours do you work? I don't work. 24-7, but I'm on call 24-7. The meds, if the phone rings and they say, we've got an upset load, I say, okay, grab my stuff. And there's some, there's been times where uh, they've called me on a Tuesday afternoon and say, we need you in Alberta, Canada tomorrow morning, or we need you in Roseburg now. And I go down to Roseburg at noon on a Friday and I don't come home until eight o'clock on a Saturday because that's how long it took to clean up and sort the whole mess out. And so that's, that's sort of where I've gone to. Um, and I love it because each day is different and I know that I'm doing something that's helping. It's hurting too because I'm reporting facts, which is the great thing about my job. I don't have to make decisions. I don't have to say, well, you're going to keep that or you're not going to keep it or we're not going to pay you, we are going to pay you. That's not my job. My job is to report the facts and then when the examiner comes back to me and says, okay, what do you think? That's when I get to give them my opinion and say, I think you're being taken for, you know, a ride here and I'd only offer this much or no everything they said is spot on and so we write the check so we get involved with you know sending out the money and I was working as a claims examiner for Honolulu Freight Service for um, oh over 20 some years I forgot about that yeah besides the inspections I was doing I was the claims manager for the Freight Service for about 20 years. And that was with signing a power. So I had a whole stack of checks and I'd make the decisions whether we pay a claim or whether we decline it or make an offer. And then I'd start cutting the checks and signing them. So that was a really intense job. And combined with everything else, as I started getting more and more involved with Great West, I realized I couldn't keep up everything. And so I decided to cut the one that was making me work the hardest for the least and go with the one that makes me work the least for the most. And that's working out well. Well, I think in these past... 10, 15 years, I would have to say it's Great West. Um, primarily because it's more responsibility and they give me carte blanche. And that was, that was something that was rather refreshing. Um, when I'm out on scene, I become the one in charge. You know, the highway department, of course, wants the highway clean and the truck out of the way so traffic flows. And I understand that and I work with them and we do, we do work together. But I also have to say, wait a minute, no, we're not going to destroy $20,000 worth of goods so you can get a freeway open an hour earlier. We're going to pick it up and we're going to stack it. <laughs> um, and I was told when I went to work for them that they will never criticize me for making a decision in the field that seemed right at the time. And so there's been times where I call up cranes in the middle of the night and said, hey, I need two cranes out here. 
You don't worry about the price. When they get there, you give them the American Express. And then you send the bill to Great West, and they pay, pay you right back. But those are the things that I, I really appreciated about them. Early in the career, one of the things I, I really enjoyed was with Harley. He would do packaging evaluations. And since I was new, he'd invite me along because he didn't like to drive, so I'd do the driving. And we'd go to the truck terminals because they'd always be at a terminal because we refused and they'd, they were concerned about packaging because there are requirements. So I'd go with them and I would learn so much from him and his boss. They'd take me to meetings. I would go to conventions and I just, I just like a sponge, I was soaking it up because there was a lot of information out there and I found out early that the one with the most information is the one that's going to be ahead of the game. You know, that's, we're in an information world. So if you've got the information, you're the key. Homelessness. That's always been my biggest fear. Uh, when my mom died at 25, my dad wasn't in the picture and my stepfather was out of the picture and I was married and I had a little baby. Um, yeah, homelessness. Because I didn't have a you know, savings account to speak of and I'd you know, been doing what I could. And when I moved up here, you know, the, the concern was always you know, that if things don't work out, what am I going to do? And so, yeah, homelessness has always been my biggest fear. Dogs. I've got Mandy, my little dog. In fact, I'm surprised she's not here today, sitting right here in my lap. But, um, no, whether it be Mandy, my little little one, or Sharon's Lottie, or the dog next, the dozer, the dog next door. Uh, I just find that if I can find dog or cat, but just because they, they just have love, you know, and it, it, it just nothing but picks you up when you see a dog, you know, panting and, and tail wagging and happy to see you. It's just uplifting. Oh. Well, that would be the riskiest thing I've ever done was probably the stupidest thing I've ever done. And that was the day I graduated from instructional college in San Diego. Everybody had taken off for the day. It was, you know, by noon, we were done. Everybody was going back to wherever they lived. And I still had my apartment in San Diego, and so I was sitting there in my apartment. Didn't know anybody, because the only people I knew were the people in the class, because we didn't have time to socialize, and they were all gone. And I just got a burning desire to, to go diving. And so I'm going, well, it's nighttime, and you don't have a dive buddy. And you're a brand new instructor, so that, that would be terribly wrong. But as I'm trying to convince myself how wrong it was, I continued to pack my dive bag and get in the car and drive out to La Jolla Shores. And then I put on my wetsuit in the little outbuildings they have out there. Got all my gear on, got my light, everything and started tromping across the beach, La Jolla Shores, to the water. And now there's a lot of people out there with campfires, enjoying the evening, and they're all watching me. Who thought, what, what? Because I got this light dangling off me and I get down to the surf line, I start backing into the surf and I stop putting the fins on and turn around and I just disappeared into the surf. Went down to about 165 feet off the shores because it's a gradual steep slope into the uh, La Jolla Trench. 
At about 165 feet, I stopped, sat on my knees, turned off my light, and just sat there in complete darkness. Couldn't smell anything, couldn't see anything, couldn't touch anything, couldn't taste anything. All your senses are obscured. And I just sensed something. So I turned my light on. And yep, there was wildlife right around me. It's like, whoa. And so I decided, OK, I've been down here long enough. Because you only have five minutes of bottom time. So it's like time to go. And so I headed back up the slope and got to the surf line, took my fins off, walked back across the beach, changed, got my car, and went home. Stupidest thing I've ever done. Could have died. And nobody would have had any idea where the hell I was because I would have been at the bottom of the ocean. Sunshine, family and friends. My accomplishment with my business and family. I mean, there's two things. One, family. Th that's where I'm re I really feel that we've accomplished well. But my career also, because I started with a camera a box of forms and a pen. And I had some business cards made up and I started knocking on doors and that was 1978. This is 2023 and I'm still doing it. And I've been told by many that I'm probably the best in the country. Favorite meal? Oh my goodness. Uh, favorite meal. Wow, that's changed over the years. Um, I'm still thinking it's got to be a good bacon burger. I, th I think I think a good bacon burger with unbendable bacon is one of my favorites. Favorite movie. Wow, that takes you back a long time because there's so many movies that I've seen over the years. Favorite movie? I, I don't think I can pick a favorite movie. I don't know if I can do that either because all the movies I watch, I really tend to like. And if I don't like them, I stop watching them. <laughs> Time is too precious. Probably the one I turned into a wedding theme, <laughs> John Denver's. Well, art back in the day, there were, we had our psychedelic posters, and it was a very vibrant colorful period where today it's more subdued um, my art used to be more photography and now I've, I've moved into acrylics and primarily pouring and using different techniques um, different types of, of pour techniques uh, and I, I tend to pour on anything that doesn't sit still. Uh, in fact, I just bought a brand new box of just little, little tiles, little white tiles that you put in your kitchen. And I'm custom painting every one of them. And so it's something I do. Anybody can do it. You don't have to be an artist. Uh, it's not overly expensive. And so I found that it's fun because it's something I can do at home. I don't have to go hiking to do it. I can do it anytime I've got a free moment. Just go out in the shop and all my paints are there and I just start creating basic designs with my paints and uh, turn them into useful things. Uh, light switch covers, uh, electrical outlet covers, uh, tiles, I make coasters out of them, 
Uh, I've made lamps out of taking spheres and pouring, doing acrylic pours on spheres and making lamps. But it's just so relaxing and refreshing because I'm creating color. And thus I have a YouTube channel, Color Spot John. And I'm going to start putting a lot of my work up there so people can see what I do. I'd like to think about selling some of the stuff that I do, but I, I figure if I put it up onto my YouTube channel, get some reaction of what people think. So um, that, back in, like I say, I, I started out with photography and did my own black and white, then worked into color, and then slides, and done weddings, and nature photography, and all sorts, and now I'm into creating my own art. Oh, the journey. Anybody can go somewhere and be there, but I'm more interested in everything in between. In other words, I can go from a city to a city. And now I've been in two cities. I'd rather, what's in between those cities? You know, slow down. Last year I spent a week or 10 days driving to California and back and using no freeways. It was the best trip I'd had in so long because I never had to be on a freeway. I took back country roads all the way to Northern California, Sacramento and beyond and back. So it's the journey. What am I most passionate about in life? I'd say nature and music. Um, I have really gotten into uh, new age piano it's it's just a very refreshing and combining that with nature uh, they just blend so perfectly now throw a couple dogs in there and you got a perfect little world the passion I have in me I, I think may come well, a lot of it's from in here but I also find that in my early years, when, when I say early years in my 20s, you know, my early 20s, when I was in Venice as a scuba diving instructor and stuff, John Denver uh, was just coming onto the scene. And his music was very powerful and still is, even though we've lost him. But when you listen to his music, you're listening to somebody talking about how life should be lived with love, compassion, tenderness, caring, you know, and, and those are the things that he, he sings about, though, you know, he sings about what he feels and, and those were important to him. And I think listening to his music and then being inspired by my own family has led me to sort of be where I'm at today. I don't have any regrets because to regret something would mean I would rather do it differently. Well, as soon as you go back and do it differently, your future's different. And I'm very happy with where my future is. So I don't have any real regrets. Because if I did, I wouldn't be who I was. I was a good, good parent and good, and good husband. Um, that I cared, and I and I, I didn't spoil our kids, but I didn't toss them out to the curb either. You know that we. I think the thing people don't know about me is the fact that. We have a wonderful family, and that I'm basically a very grounded person. I'm a very simple person, you know. Uh, give me some good music, 
some sunshine. I'm happy as can be. You know, just life is too short not to enjoy as much of it as you can. And that's why I think I've been so lucky because with my career since 78, I've been doing something I love doing. Um, I was good at it when I started, <laughs> caught on real quick, and the writing part of it, I've always been able to express myself pretty well, and so being able to describe in detail what I'm seeing in the written word was, was a talent that I had that uh, made it so really, although I worked, I never really felt that I worked. It, it, it just became a thing. In other words, what are you doing? I'm going to get up and go to work. But unlike everybody else, they say, well, how many miles do you have to commute? Well, I really don't commute. I just drive about 100 miles a day. But none of it's commuting because I don't have, I'm not going to a place to, I'm going to a number of places. My car is my office. And so it is what it is, you know, and I just love doing it. So. I don't know, I just, life is too short, but I think family's important, friends are important, and our true friends are like family. Um, and that's how I can tell if somebody's a true friend. If, if I wouldn't mind inviting them to Thanksgiving dinner, you know, those are my friends, as opposed to people that have a hundred friends, but God, I don't want to spend time with them. <laughs> I'd rather have three friends and spend time with them. That's my philosophy. I think if anything else, because they all know how proud I am of them, I think if anything else, what I would love to be able to do is let them know I'm okay. Whether it's you know, we've seen more birds show up. You know, just, I don't know how that works. None of us do. You know, uh, I, I have no idea what to expect when the, when the final curtain closes. I hope it's a field of dogs. <laughs> you know, just running at me like, all oh, my old dogs, ah! You know, but... Um, yeah, I, I don't know that there are words from beyond other than I'm good. Because, like with Grandma, if, if we could know it's all good, we could, you'd feel better. And I know when you hear those stories about people getting a message from beyond, that's what I would love to do, is send a message from beyond somehow to let you guys know I'm okay. I love you. Dude, awesome. This will be easier when it's not my dad. <laughs> 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 ah. You did great. Okay, so did you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh. And I don't think there's anything there that'll get me in too much <laughs> trouble. I could hear mom at one point going, oh, just don't, you didn't say fuck, did you? <laughs>